Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor... Back into our Father's Word. We're going to start a new book today. The second book of Peter. Peter meaning rock in, in, the, um, uh, in the language. Um, and um, we Petra in the Greek. And we can see by going to chapter 3, verse 1, that this book is written to the same people the first book was written to, which is to say in 3.1, it states the second epistle, Beloved, now I write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. In other words, documenting that this is the second letter he sent to the same people, meaning those that were scattered abroad. God's election. There is there's fantastic meat for every Christian. But at the same time, we go to a little more depth, if you choose, in knowing what God's orders are to his election. All three chapters of this uh, second Peter basically handle a different subject. It was obvious that things were a little hard at, at, at the time of this writing in the area of which it was uh, addressed, who, of whom it addressed, that false teachers were beginning to come in and so on and so forth. And Ch Peter in this first chapter will, will again reveal to them how important it is that they choose God, that they choose God's knowledge, that they follow Him, therefore arming themselves for what we will be discussing in chapter 2 and 3. Chapter 2 will let you know that the false teachers are even aided a little bit and even addresses the end times by higher powers than human beings, that is to say powers from on high. Now, with that groundwork, this first chapter is a beautiful chapter in as much as it's written to you personally, uh, as God is not a respecter of persons, telling you how to strengthen yourself. Now, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, let's go with it, and it reads, Simon, Peter, a servant and an apostle, that's to say one sent forth of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained to who is it written? To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we lose the word obtained. Uh, the reason I emphasized it a little bit is because it does not carry the full weight of the Greek word that but English word obtained was transferred from. So I'm going to ask, the, if they will, to call up on the character generator the Greek word from your Strong's Concordance 2976, which is lenkeno, lenkeno, a prolonged form of a primary verb, all right? In other words, it is the full verb, which is only used as an alternate in certain tenses to lot or determine by uh, uh, implication receive especially by lot which is to say as it is used in the King James Version his lot be or to cast lots or obtain all right which means what the lots were cast by God on those that were chosen before the foundations of the earth the reason I wanted to, to go to that verb specifically is this. Only can it be translated really as to mean by lot, all right, which means by election. And the word was changed to read obtained, and it doesn't quite cut it, all right? You lose a little bit. Why am I emphasizing that? To show it is written to the same people as they are addressed in the first book of Peter because it is the election. 
uh, the lots cast by God knowing those that he chose before the foundations of the earth as it is written in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Now let's continue on verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. In other words, uh, implying a personal acquaintance with Christ, our Savior, and Almighty God. But it's important that you note that grace, that's to say favor and peace, be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God, your knowledge of God. In other words, to the point that you become personally acquainted, whereby you read His Word, study His Word, gain that knowledge, whereby you feel you have a personal um, acquaintance. Then you're, you're beginning to get your feet on the ground. You should have a personal acquaintance with them, with the Godhead, for one very simple reason. It's your family. It's your father. And to take his advice, you should always take your, your father's advice over anyone else's. I'm speaking of our heavenly father as well as your earthly father. In, in most cases, there would be exceptions because of, of um, various uh, weaknesses of the flesh, but be that as it may. He is your Father, and by the knowledge of God do you find peace. There, the knowledge of this earth age, the knowledge of the world, street knowledge, will not bring you peace of mind. Why? You drop out the grace, which is to say the favor of God, which is to say the blessings of God. And without the blessings of God, you cannot be happy in this lifetime. It takes that. You might find some joy along the way, but you're not going to be fulfilled and find that peace of mind without having that personal acquaintance with the Savior who loved you enough that he paid a great price for you and that personal walk absorbing the knowledge of God, which gives you that blessed walk with him, blessed walk because God's blessings are upon you. Verse 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. In other words, our Father's divine power. You don't see it. It's no accident. Many people think, boy, have I been getting the breaks lately. Divine power of God. Pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge, through what? Through the knowledge of him that hath called us, cast lots for us. Uh, a little deeper than that, the verb to lot being to lot those that stood against Satan in the first rebellion, us to glory and virtue. That, um, that is yours. But it comes through what? It's important, beloved, that you grasp this. Through knowledge. Now, many people choose to as a matter of fact, I received a letter today from a man that said, I enjoy listening to you. I wish I had your faith that Christ was really, that it was really real, that I could believe upon him, because in one sense, whether it's true, whether Christ is true or not, to believe it, it's obvious it changes lives and helps people. So it couldn't be all that bad. He closed it by saying, I don't see how you can say you you say, I love you, at the close of each program, how you could love somebody that you've never met. Well, only those that have blinders on of this earth age might not understand the depth of God's election, and it is God's election that chooses to study more in depth. But when you have a personal acquaintance with the living God and you have the knowledge of his word, you cannot help loving those, whether you've met them in the flesh or not, as immaterial. Who have walked that walk of him in their daily lives, why? Because they are a people blessed above all people, documenting that it is true. 
I felt sorry for that gentleman. I really did, and I hope that he continues to study and someday let his faith say simply that word love, and I figure that that lack of love probably is what, what has taken trust, has what has taken him to the place that he is. But to just simply continue studying and gaining knowledge and then someday say, I love you, Lord, and feel the instant warmth of his touch. It's not something you imagine. It's a reality and you feel it. And his blessings begin to pour out upon you. <clears throat> be that as it may, knowledge of God is a blessed gift for those that God has called to glory and given that virtue. Verse 4, whereby are given unto us, and this is how we get them, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, and he keeps his word promises of God, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, that supernatural divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and I will add mistrust, if you only look at the corruption of this world, and what it brings, especially in the larger cities, it's real easy to lose your faith and your trust. But that's not God's fault. That's man's fault that does not seek after treasure and hunt the Word of God, knowledge of God, to receive the blessings that His divine nature. Uh, you know, um, you do this I feel I should bear down on that perhaps just a little bit so some might understand it better. Why would he say, he didn't say divine will. He said divine nature because God is more natural. Do you understand? In other words, you cannot, I repeat, cannot obtain this by human nature because human nature will cause lust to come into your body and so forth. That is even natural if you're not careful, if you allow yourself to be off guard for a moment. It's only natural that the human body will luster after a lust, lust rather, after a great big old chocolate cake, mmm, or something that you have no business partaking of other than that that is in moderation. It's the flesh that does that. But by God's divine nature, he comes, he touches you, and can change those things to strengthen you and pull you away from this world age. That is to say, protect you in this earth age. Peter will be talking about this world age uh, uh, considerably. Verse 5, and besides this, on top of this, giving all diligence. Do you know that? Let's say giving all care. Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. This virtue is a very interesting word in the Greek. I choose not to actually go to it because it, it, it is not in the gender sense, but it's very male and it means uh, how can I say this? Very, uh, so that you don't take it in the sense of gender, it means very manly in the sense of strength, strong. To, to uh, have one the ability to lift a thing. That's what the word means. In other words, uh, we might say that, um, that God gives you resolution, and the power to do it with, all right? Now, what about knowledge? That's intelligence. Now, let's cover that again, and I'm gonna do just, a, I'm going to bring those things out 
as we read them in that verse 5. And besides this, giving all care. In other words, God is very careful. Add to, add to your faith, that is your sure knowledge that he exists, this strength and ability to be a doer. That's what it means. And to this strength to be a doer, the knowledge or the intelligence to do it with. You can't beat that, friend. There's nobody in this world, in human nature necessarily, that has even the ability to give you these gifts that we just mentioned. Verse 6. And to knowledge temperance. Boy, that's a hard one for many of us, isn't it? Self-control. Temperance, self-control. And to temperance or to self-control, patience. Patience means steadfastness. Don't quit. Don't be a quitter. Be patient and stay with that. Uh, and to patience, godliness. In other words, that divine nature. He adds that divine nature onto that. And you... What does that do to you? When that divine nature is added onto you, then you take on that countenance. You can't help it. The eye mirrors the soul. You take on that countenance of a Christian, a real Christian, a person that people enjoy being around. You lift people when they're down. You can't help it. Why? The very divine nature rests within you. I'm not saying you become a goody-goody two-shoes. Unfortunately, as long as we're in the flesh, we fall short. But dwelling within you, you do have that nature. And it is very detectable by people that are in this troubled world today. All right? And these gifts, this self-control, this stick to this patience to accomplish a thing, you know, uh, there's one way that you always succeed. That's just don't quit till you get there. If God's going to give you the power and the strength to accomplish it, to be a can-do type person, and you're going to get it done. You're going to be able to cut it. To be a doer in most things that you attempt. Naturally, there occasionally there's going to be something that perhaps God doesn't want you to accomplish. But that happens rarely among those that are ca the lot has been cast for of the election. Verse 7. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brother kindliness, charity, which means Christian love. Love of doing for a father and expecting nothing in return. But he always uh, pays well. I'll use that terminology. God just, he just loves his children that bless him, that, do, that love him, that take his word and grow personally acquainted with him. Family. The family of God. Then that love flows. Oh, how I how I feel sorry for those in this world that do not have that and have not experienced it. Verse 8. For if these things be in you and abound, that means you do something with them, they make you that ye shall neither be barren. This means in the sense of uh, you're not going to be idle, okay? You're, you're going to be alive, vivacious nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, when you have all these things going for you, the knowledge, the patience, the self-control, the strength and the power of the divine nature, you can't help producing fruit. And uh, what is someone that is barren in a spiritual sense? Duh, they're void. Nothing there. Nobody home. They're of this world. And, and they uh, beat their heads against brick walls as far as trying to get ahead. And they don't understand the wisdom of God and the knowledge as to how it's done. Does it not make sense, dear one, that 
God foretold us all things that shall happen. Anyone that couldn't get ahead, even with even without the blessings of God, to know the prophecy and his promises and to see them come to pass one after the other, even such as the new world order right now, do not have even financially taken advantage of that. They can't stop you. And then add God's blessings on top of that. What a time to live. What a time to live. In other words, you cannot help but being fruitful when you serve the living God and are included in the family, the lot, that he through the divine nature blesses with all his promises. They're just one thing. Well, how do I know his promises? By knowing his word, by gaining that knowledge, it's just full of wonderful promises, but not one of them, not one of them will be given to you until you claim it by recognizing it and having the knowledge to know it's there for you and then ask. Do without if you want to. No one will really care all that much. But you don't have to do without. You can be somebody by working at it, by not being idle, that is to say barren. You may not, you might say, well, I really pick things up slow. Well, hey, after 40 years of studying this word, that's a long time. I still don't know all there is to know about God's promises, but at least I have patience to keep hanging in there even at 40 years plus, trying to pick more of them out, all right? So don't, don't ever give up. Have that stick to that patience, all right? God will bless you. And it would seem that he, in this new generation, the intelligence and the ability through the divine nature to grasp the word much faster is certainly abounds at this time. Verse 9, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. In other words, they're so short-sighted, they run into and stumble over everything that gets in the path, all right? and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. I'll tell you what, it, it, is, it is almost a sin. It is a sin, really, in, in a form. It's an insult to the Father for someone to, to have committed a sin. And it would seem that when some people commit a sin, they say, oh, woe is me. Well, like as if it's, they're the only one that could have ever possibly happened to. Well, poor baby, you know? But once you repent, in other words, you're not all that hot. That's what I'm saying. If you committed it, you're just like everyone else. We're all flesh. It happens. That's what I'm saying, and that's no excuse to do it. But don't get on one of those, oh, I did it. I repented to God. Will he ever forgive me? That's an insult to God, my friend. When he purges you of a sin, he doesn't want to hear about it again. Doesn't want to hear about it. Why? He blots it out. He promised you he would, and every time you bring it up, there it comes back off the blotter again. And pretty soon he gets tired of it. So it's an insult to him, and what you're really saying is God can't forgive sins even though Christ died on the cross and paid the price for it. I want to hang on to this little sin because I know I'm a better person than would do something like that and I know nobody's ever going to forgive me ever. The thing is, you're not forgiving yourself. And if you can't forgive yourself, you're in trouble. You see, I would almost question your repentance because when you truly feel sorry and have that change of heart in repentance, then you have to forgive yourself because you have to be in that state of mind to know that a lot of us at certain times have done some things that are pretty no good, all right, which means we're no good. And the way you get healed is that when he cleanses that sin, turn loose of it, forget it. It's his promise. It's over. So. 
if you go around blind, wading around in your sins, never cleaning out the dog pen, then how in the world are you going to accomplish anything? And I'm speaking in a spiritual sense. Don't insult my father after having repented of a sin to keep bringing the filthy thing back up again. Forget it. And then be a doer and move ahead in your life, okay? It's gone. Forget it. Verse 10. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence. Uh, give, be careful in this to take care, to, take, to make your calling an election firm. And there he comes out with that word election. Make it firm. When you repent, know that it's gone, over, done with. And if you do these things, you shall never fall. Do you know what that is? That's a promise. You may stagger. You may even fall to one knee. You may even skin your knee. But you're never going to fall all the way down as long as you work at gaining the knowledge of God and the blessings of God. You're his child. He loves you. He has his divine nature in and around you. He will boost you up and give you the breaks and you will succeed and you will never fall. Don't wish for those things. Do them. You have to work at it. If you sit back and wish for it, you'll never have it. God loves doers, especially doers that have the faith to back it up. Verse 11, for so an entrance, that's a gate, shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The gate's there, friend. It's always going to be available to you. Always there, abundantly. And when you have peace of mind, and when you have a guarantee, you might as well say, what, what I mean, assurance would be a better word, that your father loves you because he'll touch you every day. Not to the magnitude that he will at times, maybe like even the first time, but the warmth of the reality of his blessings and love. That gate is always there. What he is assuring you, don't fall away. Keep your eye on the gate, all right, of the kingdom that is eternal. Verse 12, wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. I'm going to keep bringing this up to you, Peter says, though you know it, because there's tough times ahead, tough times ahead. 13, yea, I think it meet, or I think it proper, as long as I am in this tabernacle, this flesh body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, just to jog your old memory every once in a while. 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me, his death and so forth, how he too would die, 15. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. And truly to this day we do. The same emotion, the same love, the same strength. You see, well, let's continue on. Let him say it for himself, 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, that's to say traditions of men, and they are with you to this day, always. Do you listen to fables of men, one verse Charlie's, or do you study God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse? The choice is yours, friend. When we made, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In other words, Peter said, I was at that mount of transfiguration. I saw him. The brilliance of he and Moses and Elijah standing there 
in that spiritual body and the power of his second coming with the rod of iron, that shepherd's staff of steel for correction. 17, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. Oh, that must have been a spectacular sight. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, the majesty, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God saying, this is the one, this is the savior. Peter giving a personal firsthand witness, testimony, report of that incident. 18, and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount, that's to say the mount of transfiguration. 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, that ye pay attention as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. In other words, that means the second advent of Yeshua, Messiah. His, his um, first advent proved and documented that he was the son. And um, that there was hope, faith, and charity for those that would partake. But in a sense here, he's saying the second advent will be absolute. With that power from on high. Not as a savior born of a virgin to be crucified. But as a king to rule with that rod of iron, absolute. There will be no one wondering at that time if Christ is a reality. And they will know of a certainty. Verse 20, listen carefully. Knowing this first, this comes first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. You know, uh, I want to go one more verse, 21, and we're going to conclude there for this lecture. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved uh, by the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that touches you today and gives you credentials of the reality of life, uh, not a religion, but a reality, the walk, that is to say the way, which is to say Christ. If Isaiah didn't sit down one day and say, well, I guess I'm going to write a book today. Jeremiah didn't say, well, I think I'll author another book. Daniel, to probably put better, you to use it as a better example, didn't even understand what he was writing in the, the latter chapters. And the man said, close it up, Daniel. You, you're going to sleep for a while. You won't understand it. Meaning it came from God. And you can read the book of Daniel today and you can see the events in the Middle East, uh, the old Babylon's uh, uh, prophecies. You see the movement of the nations as it moves into a one world system. In other words, there was nothing personal in the fact that Isaiah saw this way or Daniel saw that way or someone else. It was all from God through the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit today when you receive Him that touches your mind and gives you that knowledge and wisdom that brings about the patience and, and the... Um, uh, temperance, the self-control, the will, and the strength to accomplish whatever God tells you to 
it all falls under the same heading, the Holy Spirit, that is to say, Shekinah, God's glory and presence in man, that divine nature. Don't ever worry, our Father is very much in control today. He only allows man to fulfill the prophecies, both the negative and the positive. Just stay with it, friend, and stay on top of it. You see, the Bible is not a book of many authors. The Bible is a book of many scribes, but only one author. In the beginning was the Word. The Word shall always be. That is where you gain your knowledge, your blessings, and quite frankly, true wealth. All right.